Hello, welcome back to Biotechnology. We're going to have a quick look at the whole process over here and then we will move on to one of the details. So in biotechnology we're trying to get an organism to do something that it normally wouldn't because we want something from it. For example, if we want a protein to cause people to be able to run better, to cause people to make more red blood cells, then it is quite cost ineffective, it's quite expensive to extract it from people's blood. It is a lot easier to get some bacteria which are cheap to grow to make it for us. So it is a lot easier to get the human instructions for how to make that protein and make it inside a bacterium instead of making it inside people which is difficult. So this is the whole process. It's not very well described, but first of all, we start off with our organism that we want the information from. So in that case, it will be a human. We extract the DNA, which we've done. We then have to get the sequence for doing the thing that we want from the DNA, which is not very easy because obviously there's a lot of information for building the organism for doing other things inside that DNA and that we don't want, we just want the information for making one thing. Then we have to process it in some way and add it to a suitable vector for we'll inserting it into its, the second organism and we will have to edit it during that time possibly so that it works better. Then we add it to the second organism, grow the organism or grow cells somehow usually while it's switched off using one of the operons that we would have added when we uh, were adding the vehicle. So then we can switch it on and off when we want to. We switch it on, make the product that we want, and then we need to get it out. So then we have more processes. We have to extract the material from the cells and purify it in some way. So seeing as I've drawn it this way around, let's concentrate on the first part of this process. What we did before, what I did for you, was a type of solvent extraction of the DNA using enzymes to break down the DNA ases so that it didn't break it and to break down the spools that the DNA is wound on so that it could unwind and then recrystallizing it effectively by changing the solvent. Or we could use a thing called PCR, which you've probably heard of. PCR is the thing that people use to make lots of DNA from a crime scene. And we can either use it to extract whole DNA, to amplify a region that we want, or if we've got a sequence that we want to make more of it. So let us look at that in more detail. Normally when DNA is replicated, a protein called polymerase comes along to an opened part of the DNA where it's been sort of stretched apart and it copies the old strand effectively onto a new strand. It makes a new strand beside it and it does it in one direction along the DNA. So if we look at the DNA backbone, it is directional. It contains five membered rings and they have a direction, so that have two bonds on one side and only one on the other. So there's a direction. There's also a nitrogen end and an acid end of the whole chain. And those chains are anti-parallel. So each one has a nitrogen end and an acid end on this end, and the other one is the other way around. So the acid end of this one is here, the nitrogen end is over there, or the other way around, vice versa. That gives it a directionality, and this polymerase will copy only in one direction. That means it can copy this one in this direction, and the other strand in the other direction, and make a new one. If the DNA is being copied to copy the whole DNA genome, it will be, this process will start at several regions at the same time, and then they all get joined back together into the new strands. This process is quite involved and it includes a lot of other proteins and small molecules that are in, that help out. So this is a helper molecule, for example, that opens it, but it also starts 
the DNA growing from somewhere and um, they have got the, the nucleotides have to come along also with chaperone molecules. Sometimes, not very often, but because there are a lot of bases in the DNA it happens regularly, sometimes the wrong base is included on a new strand and so it doesn't pair up. This leads to the two bases next to each other not attaching very well so it generates a kind of lump on the DNA. Luckily there's a way of fixing this which nature has discovered or invented in fact. So if we take this piece and have it unconnected there is an entire process that comes along and snips out the wrong base and fixes it. But it raises the question because this molecule that sits here can't know that this chain is the original one and this chain is the old one by looking over here because molecules can't see very far away from where they really are it has to get the information some other way and the way it gets the information is that DNA once it's produced is altered chemically by adding methyl groups it's methylated on the side which from us, our point of view as chemists is a really worrying thing because if we use a methylating agent it makes it really really dangerous because it can add these methyl groups to our DNA that makes it super bad if, so if a molecule comes along and discovers that there's a bulge on this DNA it will find the old strand and cut the new strand removing this base and replacing it with the correct one which makes this process polymerase copying of DNA extremely good it makes an extremely good quality copy because it self corrects so how can we uh, use this to our advantage we're, we're trying to do biotechnology we're trying to use biological systems to do things that they wouldn't normally do on their own so we want to we, every time a biologist or a biochemist whatever you want to call them sees a process one of the things that almost always happens is somebody comes up with a way that it can be used to our advantage a new and different way of abusing it so if we take this polymerase molecule we would like to be able to use it to make more DNA but we would like to be able to use it without having to make these other molecules as well and add them to the mixture to hold our DNA apart we would like to make it easy and practical and cheap ideally usually it's not cheap so instead of having a molecule that opens up the DNA and does it where it's needed to copy and then in bacteria at the part called the origin we would like to be able to copy the DNA that we want which is maybe some that we found at a crime scene or in our case for biotechnology it's some that we've decided is the sequence that we want to uh, make a protein that we need whatever it is because we want to make some money so instead of opening it with a protein we open it with heat if we warm this up it falls apart why does it fall apart? well what's holding these together? hydrogen bonding is holding them together and we are utilizing Gibbs free energy so going back to our first semester we, we know that the Gibbs free energy is equal to delta H minus T delta S delta H is the bonding energy or the heat given out in this case we are breaking a bond so we are losing energy but if we heat it up the amount of entropy or the effect of the entropy goes up because the temperature is only in the entropy term so if we heat up this reaction it's not really a reaction it's a physical process if we heat it up it will drive it in this direction because there are more different possibilities on this side than there are on this side this is very ordered this is not so ordered so if we heat it up we'll go this way if we cool it back down again we'll go this way 
and we get the bonding energy back out again because if the T is smaller, the heat of reaction dominates and our Gibbs free energy is favourable to the reaction going in this direction. So we know we can do this reversibly and we can change the temperature and we don't have to do anything else which is really handy because heating stuff up, what could be simpler? In step two we have a new problem. So we would like to copy this strand of DNA somehow and we have the problem the polymerase can't just start from the end of this strand how would it know where the end is? It might start in the middle, it might start somewhere and to stop it from doing that in a natural case it starts where the DNA is just opening and there are molecules there that do that but we don't have any of those molecules and we don't have a piece of DNA that is sort of finished, a double-stranded piece of DNA so what we need is a piece of double-stranded DNA and then a piece of single-stranded DNA to mimic the natural situation so we choose a primer which is a short section of DNA that matches a bit on our sample that we have uh, sorry about my eyes being shifty it's because the camera's weird so the primers and we need two of them one for the left strand and one for the right strand which are complementary to each other so they're opposite bases they're not the same so we could copy one strand but not the other one and then we wouldn't get any further so we need to copy both we need two primers the primers have to be a match to a sequence of bases on their strand and preferably up near one end so that we copy them Whoops. the only piece of information that we will copy the only piece of DNA that we'll copy is the bit between two primers at least in large quantities. We'll copy the first case, this one all the way to the end and then this one all the way to the other end but when we copy it again, when we copy this strand we will use a green one and it will copy this one down to here. Bearing in mind this is just a diagram, they're not really only three bases long, they're a lot longer than that and obviously the section that we want is not as short it's all got a lot more data on it than I've drawn but I can't sit here all day drawing little dots the good thing about the primers is that they can do something useful for us because they can be specific to something that we want so if we take a sequence a primer that is specific to humans and we are investigating a crime scene then all of that dog DNA that may be in your house, all of that tree DNA, because pollen is absolutely everywhere, all of the other DNA from your cat and from the food that you've eaten, all of that is not copied. Only the human DNA is copied, which is great, because then we can choose what we want. In other examples, we can take samples of seawater and extract DNA of specific types of organism that we want to, that we want to find sharks for example or tiger DNA in poo obviously tiger poo contains a lot of DNA of the animals that they've eaten as well as their own we want to extract just one type and in this case with this reaction we have a way of doing it obviously it's not perfect but it is good if we're really lucky we can use this to cut down our section to just the bit that we want so in the third step we add we have some polymerase and that takes effect it joins onto the molecule and it starts to write the second side of the DNA along in one direction from the primer to the end by adding nucleic acids that are in the solution. So we need our, our uh, DNA ready as single nucleic acids to come along and attach to our growing strand and to the other one that's growing in the other direction. Then we need to go back to stage one, heat it up, break it up again and continue. 
So this is the process drawn out a little bit differently. Here we start with one piece of DNA, we heat it up, we get two single strand pieces of DNA, we cool it down a little bit, and our primers attach. Then we allow, so it pulls down the third step, it allows the DNA, the polymerase, to grow the strand to the end on both, in both directions. Then we heat it up again, causing the strands to break into the four at the end with a green primer, this one. So a shorter piece of DNA in one direction and the red one in the other direction. And then we go back to this stage, allow the primers to reattach and go round and round. So we can see that out of one strand of DNA, we've made two strands of DNA, but they're not quite the same, they're shorter. And then we go round and round and we end up with some longer DNA. So there's obviously going to be a lot of intermediate bits, but most of the DNA that we make is between the two primers. Also, every cycle we double the amount of DNA that we have because we heat it up and every strand breaks into two and each of those strands grows a new one so every temperature cycle doubles the amount of protein. The really cool thing about this is if we add an enzyme, these uh, polymerase is an enzyme, it won't get used up very quickly. So the only thing that's being used up is the nuclei, uh, the, the bases, the nucleic acids, and they can be added as a, a large amount and then we have all we have to do is heat and cool the mixture. So we have a device called a thermal cycler, which will just heat it up and cool it down. And overnight, typically, we will make a whole load of DNA because every cycle it doubles. So even if we don't have very much from wherever our sample is, we will end up with a lot at the end. Of course, in our artificial version, we have sacrificed a little bit because we don't have the mechanism for repairing accidents. If it copies, if it makes a mistake, we will carry the accident forward. So it isn't exactly, it isn't as good. It's not as accurate as the natural system, which fixes itself. At this point, if it was a crime scene investigation, we would cut this DNA that we get at the end, the shorter strands, but lots of them, into sections with restriction enzymes, which remember are the cell's defenses against incoming DNA. It cuts it up, typically either, well, typically either a straight cut or a staggered cut, but it cuts it into sections at known points. So it doesn't just randomly cut it, it cuts it at a sequence of bases cuts it into sections and we can use those sections to identify people or animals or organisms, whatever we're interested in finding out. An analog of this is the reverse transcriptase process. So in normal polymerase reaction, DNA is copied to make more DNA. That's a sort of copying process. With transcriptase, DNA is transcribed into RNA and the RNA then goes away to be the template for making proteins. But there is an alternative system that is used by retroviruses such as Corona that's infecting people at the moment. What does Corona, HIV do to infect people when it doesn't actually have any DNA to be able to copy? Instead of DNA, it has its information on an RNA strand, which is smaller and easier to pack, but it has to first of all be converted into DNA so that it can be used to make new RNA, because RNA is not typically copied to make more RNA. For that we need an enzyme called reverse transcriptase, which is effectively doing the opposite of transcribing the DNA to RNA, it's transcribing RNA into DNA. So with reverse transcriptase, the RNA coming from the invading virus is copied into a single strand of DNA that makes a sort of paired strand. And then the RNA is degraded away 
and a DNA second strand is added to the other side. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but there are several different families of reverse transcriptases and they work very slightly differently. So we'll use a simple model. Let's just have a look at the drawing of it. So there is the RNA in blue. So a single strand of DNA is added and the RNA is then removed and it's usually completely destroyed by RNAase uh, attached to the same molecule usually and that allows the other strand of DNA to form in the normal way to make the double-stranded piece of DNA from the single-stranded piece of RNA. As you can imagine, this is not as good as normal transcriptase and it's even worse than uh, than we would imagine because this copying process is less accurate than DNA copying and it cannot be rectified. There is a massive advantage however if we have some RNA that makes a protein that we want we can convert that RNA back into DNA so if for example we have a protein uh, for making red blood cells and we want to know what the DNA for it looks like, it's difficult from the protein because there are a lot of possibilities. But if we find the RNA that codes for it, we can use this reverse transcriptase to make DNA out of it. And then we know what the sequence for making that protein is so we can either search for it inside the genome or we can use that sequence that we've now made to put into our organism. We will have to do some PCR to make more of it because we probably won't have very much, but we know how to do that now. In the viruses, this has an interesting uh, knock-on effect that they tend to be much more prone to, to mutate, to form new viruses than DNA viruses because this step of reverse transcription is relatively error prone so it makes some DNA that isn't quite the same copy and obviously that very often kills the virus or it's not really alive so it prevents it from working but if there are several copies of the virus in the cell that doesn't matter if a working copy gets in, it can do its job. And if it has surface proteins on it, if it has surface groups that we would like to target for a vaccine, it can change those relatively quickly and randomly because the RNA transcriptase process, the reverse transcription process, is error prone. So it tends to change much more quickly than natural evolution would. Okay, that's enough for that little subject cluster. Next time we will look at the next part of the process, how to get that piece of DNA that contains the information to make the protein that we want into a vector so that we can then go further and put it into the organism, remembering that our core experiment for this course is P. Glow from Biorad, which is in films on this same set, not by me, by other places, they've done it better. That whole process is taking a gene from a jellyfish, from a bacterium that lives in a jellyfish that makes a green fluorescent protein, adding it to a plasmid, which is a short circular section of DNA with a promoter so that it can be made putting it into some poo bacteria, E. coli, and having them make the green fluorescent protein and then checking that they in fact fluoresce by adding some ultraviolet light and seeing the fluorescence. We can extract the green fluorescent protein from that with a further step. So that is our core experiment. This is how we would get there Typically one buys the plasmid in the case of the P-Glow experiment, but obviously if we were going to do this for a new protein that we want to make, we would have to do all of the steps.
see you next time.